All right, everybody, I'm Dr. Scott Masson here to talk to you about the third episode of The Rings of Power. And uh, today's episode shifts scene. Uh, we've looked at the realm of the dwarves and of the elves and also of the uh, hobbits. Uh, and we shift our gaze now to the uh, Numenorians, which uh, I'm I was very interested and rather excited about, but we don't go there directly, although the majority of my commentary will uh, be engaging with the Numenorians and their depiction. Um, but the scene begins uh, with the characters that I've not actually mentioned thus far, um, at least to no great degree, the uh, Sylvan elves who had been protecting one of the outposts down in the south uh, where uh, men had been uh, uh, protected uh, for many a time and where recently the protection had been withdrawn at the order of Gilgalad. That's where we left off last time. And of course, rather ominously, we saw signs that uh, this order was uh, about as bad as one uh, could time an order because, in fact, we see this, the uh, signs that evil is at work in the earth, not only in the form of uh, falling uh, leaves, which are black uh, underneath, and also of, um, of cows uh, uttering forth black milk, but also we've seen signs of, uh, of uh, wargs and, uh, and even uh, a few orcs and we pick up our episode here with a, precisely that the sylvan elves at the outpost are in fact captured by orcs who have been tunneling and covering their tunnel up with uh, with some sort of form of canopy that protects them from the sunlight and those of you who uh, watch the lord of the rings series or know uh, of this they will know that uh, unlike the urukai that sauron breeds uh, the orcs are afraid of the light. The light reminds them of the Eldor and uh, is as fit, fitting a symbol of uh, the enmity between light and darkness and the fear of the darkness and the light as anything else could be. And so we find here a sort of tunnel and the uh, orcs uh, wearing some sort of skins to protect themselves, but above all, they're building a canopy but also a, um, a tunnel, and there are sort of questions surrounding this, why on earth they would be tunneling rather than simply uh, wandering about uh, during uh, nightfall rather than walking in the day and digging tunnels. So there may be something else af afoot there. And one hint of that is there's a scene in which down one of the tunnels we see two um, apparent uh, uh, orcs talking, but one of them is shorter than the others, and there's some sense that maybe something else is afoot. Maybe somebody is in uh, in disguise in the same way that hobbits disguise themselves as orcs uh, while in um, uh, approaching Mount Doom, uh, Sam and uh, uh, Frodo, if you recall. But I'm not going to spend too much time on that. It's it's semi-interesting. We also uh, briefly f uh, revert to the uh, a look at the halflings, um, and um, I have to admit that I am thoroughly annoyed by the, their depiction already. I find them a distraction and without any particular interest, other than the fact that they are uh, a sort of hobbit. Uh, but these Harfoots. Um, are just simply unappealing as characters. Their dialogue is inept. They seem to lack any appeal whatsoever. They're just sort of comic relief, but they're not funny. So that's not, <laughs> that's not good. Um, so let's go to something that looks a little bit more promising. Uh, we find, if you recall at the last episode, that um, uh, we had the two figures of uh, Galadriel and also of... Um, uh, Halbrand, the man, um, on this ship, Halbrand having saved Galadriel, uh, and a man on, or a figure on a ship's deck looking down upon them, well, this has been their rescuer, and it is none other than uh, a race of Numenorians. And who is this 
individual that has saved them, who's the captain of the ship. Well, he's none other than Elendil, the father of Isildur, who also appears in on ship as a young novice, a trainee sailor. Uh, and we will find that he is about to earn his spurs. Um, and there's a little scene in which he saves uh, another young man from certain death, uh, being uh, a rope breaks and snaps, and he manages to save him. Uh, but there is a, a tension between Elendil and Isildur, uh, which uh, plays itself out over the course of the episode. So there's human interest involved in that. We also see that uh, Elendil has managed to purloin uh, Galadriel's dagger, which she does spot in his uh, belt, but manages to restrain herself and not throw herself uh, recklessly at him, uh, very much against her type, at least as she's been cast thus far. And I, again, I, I express my dissatisfaction with uh, Galadriel as this revenge tragedy hero, um, at warrior princess, uh, lacking in all uh, wisdom and uh, seemingly lacking the virtues of uh, femininity whatsoever. There's, as I say, a sort of Byronic hero in feminine guise. Um, so there's uh, exchanges between them, and of course, just because of the names of the figures, we are, those of us who are Tolkien fans, are interested in what is about to transpire. And we are not disappointed when the ship uh, steers towards uh, no other place than Numenor itself, which is a star-shaped island not depicted in the Lord of the Rings. And I have to say it's rather uh, breathtakingly done. <clears throat> uh, we have not the uh, Norgoth who are forbidding the, the two men uh, saying don't enter. We, we have a figure of Erendil there beckoning with his hand open, welcoming them to the island. And there's some irony here because uh, what we find is that the Numenorians uh, do nothing like welcome uh, their elven visitor. In fact, we find that there's an enmity between the elves and the men such that the elves are not uh, welcome at all and have not been for some time. So there's a backstory there. So this is interesting. Let me just talk a little bit about the depiction of Urendil. Uh, Urendil is the father of Elrond and Elros, and Elros has uh, chose to be a mortal man at one point. Uh, he is depicted here, and of course, um, um, he is portrayed with a with a this headband, the Silmaril, uh, on his brow, and his wife beside him. If you uh, flip back, you might not even notice it carved into uh, the mountain as well. A uh, a bird. Well, that is his wife, Elwing, who uh, once presented herself in, in such a guise. And that name, uh, Irendil, uh, if you'll recall from the Lord of the Rings, uh, was the one who uh, whose star uh, was captured within Galadriel's file, the light of Irendil. Um, and, and after his uh, exploits battling against Sauron, or rather against, uh, not Sauron, but uh, Morgoth. Uh, he uh, sailed across the skies, skies as a star. And uh, we will find that stars uh, here in Tolkien, much as in Dante, uh, have great symbolic importance. And um, we then enter the city. Oh, by the way, in the background, there's uh, something like... Um, uh, this this flat mountain of uh, of uh, gosh what's it called uh, Menaltarma that's it and this is a, a sacred mountain um, right at the center of the island of Numenor and it's got a flat summit it's used for for secret gatherings and it's not um, one that is approached easily or lightly for that matter it's just lurking in the background some human interest there. By the way, for those of you who are not aware of Numenor and its uh, significance, Tolkien says himself in one of his letters that it is uh, to be understood as something like Atlantis. And so we know what will happen to this island of Numenor. But before we get to that point, um, we go inside uh, to the capital city 
uh, whose name is Armenalos, uh, which is an extraordinary place. Armenalos, the golden, the city of the kings, and this is the capital city of Numenor. Uh, we find in the midst of this uh, magnificent city uh, a white tree. Now, those who, again, remember the Lord of the Rings will remember the white tree of Gondor and its significance. It's on, uh, it's the sigil on the breastplate of uh, Aragorn, among others, and, and all of the men of Gondor. Uh, but here, this is a different tree. This is not the same white tree. This is not the white tree of Gondor, but rather the white tree uh, called uh, Nimloth. Nimloth is in the middle of this city here, and uh, for those of you who know the lore of Tolkien, it's presented in the appendices, uh, this city was cut down by Sauron and burnt <coughs> when he uh, burned on the altar of the temple. And so this is, of course, again, uh, for those who uh, see the coming evil and are knowledgeable of uh, the lore that's in the appendices, we will see foreshadowing, dramatic foreshadowing of events that will soon occur. But we're still putting those episodes together here. Um, note that the, uh, and let me say something about these trees. The trees themselves uh, signify the two trees of Valinor that were there originally presenting the light. Remember at the episode one, we had a reference to light before the lights in the heaven were created. Well, that the light of, of the Valinor were, were cast uh, trees. Tolkien using two trees here may be a sort of a, um, analogy, although not an allegory, to the two trees presented in the Garden of Eden. And these two trees uh, give light. And these white trees are the offspring of those those two trees, and so they are uh, they are revered for the light that they present, and of course, they are symbolic of goodness and flourishing, not only in and of themselves, but also of those uh, who um, are living in the midst of these trees. Now, for which reason we are told a little later in an episode uh, in the episode that when the leaves of the tree fall, that the tears of the Valar are also following, so a sign of uh, weeping, a sort of uh, pathetic fallacy, if you will. Um, but they have not yet been burned, although they appear to have been disregarded. Now, we enter the court at this point uh, of the Numenorians, and we are greeted by two individuals, one whose name is Alfarazan, um, and, the, and, his, and the queen regent whose name is Miriel. Uh, and we can see uh, the surprise amongst all the Numenorians that an elf is in their midst. And we can also see that there is uh, not only surprise, but hostility there. So uh, Miriel refers to Galadriel as simply as elf in the same way we saw um, um, Elrond received greetings from the dwarfs. So there's enmity between the peoples of uh, Middle-earth, palpable, tangible, a sign that evil's already in their presence, that they are no longer even on speaking terms. So all of this is very interesting. It's rather well done, although the dialogue is, as throughout, um, almost painful at points. It seeks to be metaphoric, but fails rather spectacularly. Um, I can only attribute that to the uh, creator's uh, lack of real linguistic uh, training. Um, they've managed to do well in terms of CGI depictions, but in terms of linguistic uh, capacity, uh, sadly lacking in my view. But the human interest story between Halbrand and Galadriel continues. Halbrand's a sort of... A, uh, you almost think that uh, there's more uh, in mind from Star Wars than there is from uh, Lord of the Rings here. Galadriel almost seems like a Princess Leia, and uh, Halbrand is a sort of wants, uh, Han Solo figure, a sort of uh, rascal, um, thief. Uh, he manages to steal Galadriel's dagger by pretending to embrace um, uh, Elendil. I remember Elendil had Galadriel's dagger. Well, he steals it back from her, and uh, some of the earlier depictions between 
uh, or of the of the power uh, rings of power series presented the two of them in close proximity it looked like uh, romance was between them I still personally feel that that unfortunately may be uh, coming still um, because uh, there's just simply too much very poor <laughs> poorly disguised foreshadowing going on here between the two of them uh, I'll get to that in a minute uh, because um, uh, we hear that uh, this man, Elendil, uh, we hear something of the intrigues in the court. So I talk about the court, and what we have here, this is a little information you might, might find helpful. At this point in the lore, in the appendices, we learn uh, uh, that under this uh, reign of uh, this king, uh, Alfarazan, the 25th and last king of uh, Numenor, um, there were, were two factions. There were the faction that called themselves the King's Men, who were the dominant faction. And on the other hand, there were those who called themselves the Faithful. Now, what's interesting about this is that the King's Men uh, were not um, uh, actually uh, the men of the true king, uh, which, who is the king that is currently imprisoned, uh, the 24th king, whose name is... Uh, who's a descendant of Tarpalantir. Um, and uh, we don't know anything about him here other than that he is imprisoned and not capable of exercising power. It also sounds like he is one of the faithful. And the faithful here, uh, what is meant by that is those who have kept faith with the elves and have not forgotten the old alliance between them. So despite the hostility with which Galadriel is received in the court, we find that, in fact, she does have friends, but the friends are not uh, at liberty to express their um, greetings to her. And one of the ways in which this does come about is when Elendil is interrogated uh, by uh, Queen uh, Miriel, the Queen Regent, and she notes of his name... Um, asks him about his name, first of all, and we, we found out already that although he has noble blood, uh, he is uh, being uh, removed from positions of significance, and he's merely a sea captain. Uh, he reveals that his name is one who loves the stars, which is one of the, one of the uh, interpretations of the name uh, in Quenya for Elendil. But, but uh, the, uh, the queen regent, Miriel, notes uh, that it also means elf friend. And so she's probing and testing him here. She's suggesting she knows more about him than he is willing to reveal. He does not, uh, he keeps his cards very close to his chest and is unwilling to reveal what he is. But there's m my sense here is that she is uh, perhaps one of the faithful herself. Um, and she's trying to t find out whether he also is one of those uh, that is a faction that is out of power in the court. So there's something of there, something of that there. I mentioned some of the terrible pained dialogue here. Um, one of the chief instances of that is when Elendil uh, speaks to uh, Galadriel and notes that uh, he has children that are just like her. Um, uh, one who's a daughter who runs fast, the second a son who runs blind. And she says, he says that uh, both of their eyes uh, her eyes resemble, resemble both of theirs. So she moves quickly and she acts blindly. In other words, she is a fool. Uh, the older man here uh, making a comment on Galadriel. And again, um, while this is a young Galadriel, it's hard to believe that she is quite as foolish, reckless, uh, and uh, quite frankly, uh, dislikable as a feminine character as all that, but that is how she is portrayed. Um, so again, stilted dialogue, uh, but still a fair bit of human interest here in this. And uh, we also find in amongst the uh, relations of these two uh, famous human figures, or of the uh, Numenorians at any rate, uh, Elendil and his son Isildur, there's considerable uh, tension and also with his, uh, with uh, Elendil's uh, daughter, for that matter, which seems to um, uh, stem back to a loss, and it's the loss of their mother, his wife, 
um, which uh, drove Elendale from the west of uh, Numenor to the capital city. And uh, to some degree, uh, we're questioning the motivation for that. The son suggests that he is fleeing his pain. The son, or, or the, the father, charges the son with exactly the same thing when the son Isildur wants to avoid the sea trial that will make him a full fledged sailor and rather to go back home. So, again, I talked about Star Wars. We have the antithesis or the reverse case of Luke Skywalker. We have a novice who doesn't want to go and prove himself. He rather wants to continue to act as a child and to stay in childish ways. The father, uh, being like all fathers, annoyed by his children, it's a lack of wisdom. Uh, expresses himself angrily, and you can tell that he almost instantaneously regrets it. However, he says what he says. And so there's the conflict between them, but also intrigue. In nine days, there will be a trial for Isildur at sea, something to look forward to. Likewise, Elendil, how he, will he relate to the uh, queen regent here in the court? Will something be revealed there? We have yet to find out. Uh, finally, uh, let me comment on Galadriel and Halbrand. Um, they look at a uh, an image on a wall in within Numenor, and it portrays uh, Irendil in the midst of uh, two groups of people: one elves and the other um, men. And uh, Galadriel comments of Halbrand pulling out a parchment that happened to just also be a sigil on. Uh, Halbrand's cloak that this is not uh, the sigil of a commoner, but rather descends from the from the line of men uh, of of royal vintage. And Halbrand's comment is that his uh, that man who was royal uh, was actually an an ally of Morgoth, and so therefore a betrayer, a traitor. Uh, Galadriel uh, responds that their paths have not crossed uh, accidentally. This is not a chance meeting, she says. And uh, the listener, the reader, the viewer at this point is minded of something of perhaps a uh, reference to Elu Iluvatar here, Eru Iluvatar. So God, having foreordained this, um, and we again get the sense of perhaps star-crossed lovers here being presented to us, but she is quite sure that um, they were meant to meet. And uh, she even adds the tidbit, which sounds to me rather odd, that uh, they both need to redeem their bloodlines. So both of them are sort of redemptive figures for their entire races. Uh, more moment and more significance there than I would have thought the text requires from us. All the same of interest. And we go back uh, to conclude with uh, a scene looking at the Sylvan Elves and their attempt to escape from their dungeon uh, tunnel uh, from the uh, orcs and simply fail to do so. So it adds, it, it ends on a rather note, a gloomy note, but enough there to intrigue us and to interest us. And I look forward to seeing what we'll have next week. Doubtless we will return to the elves or perhaps those wretched hobbits and hopefully we'll find out more about the stranger who, as I said, I'm quite sure is Gandalf. But we shall find whether I'm correct soon enough. Till then. <laughs>